This lesson deals with complex algebra. You can find these notes in the ECE 202 ebook in chapter 8 starting on page 7. Suppose that we add two complex numbers. We can do that in polar form or in rectangular form. Suppose I have two phasors, x1 and x2, and I'm going to add them. But x1, say, is equal to 10 at angle minus 45, and x2 is 5 at angle 30. One way to add them is graphically. So let's take x1, it has a length of 10, an angle of minus 45. So I use a protractor to find the angle of minus 45, which is halfway between the real and imaginary axis, and then I use the length of about 1 inch to give my value of 10. Then x2 is at 30 degrees, so I measured 30 degrees of my protractor, and then about a half of an inch. You may recall from geometry or algebra that to add two vectors, what you have to do is translate one of these. So I'm going to bring this vector over here, and then the resultant vector would be this one right here. I measured the length as best as I could and got about 12.3, and I measured this angle, and it was about a minus 21.8. Now let's do the same problem in rectangular form, using Euler's identity. So my first phasor was 10 at angle minus 45, so that's going to be 10 times the cosine of minus 45 plus j 10 times the sine of minus 45. And the cosine of plus or minus 45 is 0 0.707, or the square root of 2 over 2. So multiply that by 10, and you get 7.07. .07. The sine, however, is an odd function, and so the sine of minus 45 is actually negative, and it's also equal to 0 0.707, or square root of 2 over 2, so multiplying that by 10. Then x2 was 5 in angle 30, so 5 times the cosine of 30, plus j5 sine of 30. The cosine of 30 is the square root of 3 over 2, and multiplying that by 5, you get 4.33, or you just punch it into your calculator. And then the sine of 30 is actually equal to a half, and you get 2 and a half. So I'm going to add these two results. So we're going to add the real to the real, and the imaginary to the imaginary. So I'm going to group those together, and I get 11.4 roughly. And then these added together, I get roughly a minus 4.57. So what I've got here is that the real part of the sum is the sum of the real parts. We're going to use this a little bit later in the chapter. All right now let's convert this to polar form to compare it to our last answer. I'll take the square root of the sum of the squares, so 11.4 squared. Not squaring the j now, but just the thing that multiplies j, so minus 4.57. And adding those two squares together in square root, I get about 12.28. Pretty close to what I did with my ruler, but this is more precise. Take the arc tangent of the imaginary over the real. Now the imaginary was negative, and the real was positive. So if you think about where this is in the quadrants, we have a real value that's positive, and an imaginary value that's negative. So we're going to be somewhere in the fourth quadrant. I got minus 21.84 degrees. Again, very close to what I did with my ruler, but this is more precise because I'm doing it with my calculator. If the minus sign were on the bottom, you'd actually be here with a positive imaginary term and a negative real term somewhere in here. Basically 180 degrees difference. So you have to be careful about where the minus sign is for the arc tangent. If you have a calculator, though, that can convert rectangular form to polar form and vice versa, then it'll take care of whether you're in one quadrant or another. So if you can find that type of a calculator, they're fairly inexpensive, but they're called scientific calculators. One last comment here, addition in rectangular form is a lot easier and really more accurate than polar form because I have to do a graphical representation of my addition. Both give you the same answer. There'll be times when we're doing symbolic phasors and the polar form will be the only way we can express the results. Consider multiplying two complex numbers. Again, I'll call them x1 and x2. Suppose that x1 is 7 at angle 60 and that x2 is 11 at minus 85. We're going to multiply these two. Now remember, what this really means is it's 7 times e to the j 60. And then x2 is really 11 times e to the minus j85. So if you multiply these two together, multiply the 7 and the 11, it's 77, and then we're going to add the exponents of e when you multiply them. If you don't remember, but e is equal to 2.71828. So adding these two together, I get a minus 25 degrees. So my phasor is 77 at angle minus 25. So I take the product of the magnitudes and take the sum of the angles to do a multiplication. So let's multiply now x1 and x2, but in rectangular form. So we'll had, we had 7 at angle 60, so that'll be 7 cosine of 60 plus j7 sine of 60. The cosine of 60 is 1 half, so we get 3 and a half here. The sine of 60 is the square root of 3 over 2. Multiply that by 7, you get 6.062. Again, or just plug this into your calculator. x2 was 11 at angle minus 85, so we'll take the cosine of that plus j times the sine of that. Cosine of a plus or minus 85 is still positive. So we'll get that result, and then the sign is actually negative. It's an odd function. comes out in front. Here's a minus sign. You get a, so if I multiply these two results, here's the first phasor times the second phasor. So now I've got a lot of bit of algebra to do here. 
So I'll multiply this times this and get 3.3565. Then multiply this times this and get a minus J38.353. And multiply this times this and get a J5.813. And then this times this, I get a J squared, which is minus one. I have another minus sign there, so I get a plus sign. So we're gonna take up the real terms and add them up. So this plus this is 69.7835. And the sum of these two, one's negative and one's positive, get 32.54. I just plug this in my calculator. It's basically you have two inputs and two outputs for your calculator. You have to learn how to do those keystrokes on whatever calculator you're using. Handy if you have a little manual that goes with it. But the magnitude will be a little bit longer than either of these two, so 77 seems reasonable. The angle will be the arctangent of the imaginary, which is negative, over the real. And again, the calculator can handle which quadrant you're in. I got a minus 25 degrees. That seems reasonable to me because this is shorter than this is. If these were equal to each other, I'd have a minus 45 degrees. If this is shorter than this, then I'm closer to zero than I am to 90 degrees from the 45 degree point. So 25 seems reasonable. So I kind of use this kind of an eyeball check to see that I've done the part of my calculator correctly. But if you look at the amount of work we just did, the multiplication in polar form was, was much quicker and a lot easier than doing in rectangular form. When we're doing symbolic results, we'll find that we can't always do both. Let's do division of two complex numbers. Suppose that I had x1, which is 6 at angle 120, and x2, which is 3 at angle 60. And I take the ratio of those two. Remember that 6 at angle 120 is a shorthand notation for 6 times e to the j 120, and I have 3 times e to the j 60. So then the ratio of these two is going to be 2 for the magnitude, and then for the exponents here, I'll take the j, it's 120, and subtract the j 60. So the difference of those two would be 60 degrees. So my resultant then is 2 at angle 60. I just divide the magnitudes, and I just subtract the angles. Again, I put this in my calculator, and I got 1 plus j, 1.732. Seems reasonable. I have a length of 2 on the hypotenuse, and then these are both shorter than that. I'm in the first quadrant because these are both positive. This is longer than this, so I'm closer to 90 degrees compared to 45 than I am to 0. So being at 60 would seem reasonable to me. And you'll need this when you're doing tests and you're just doing problem solving. You have another way to kind of visually check that your work is correct. Do the same problem in rectangular form. To punch into my calculator the first phaser, I got minus 3 plus j 5.196. You can see if that's reasonable with the value I had here. I had 6 at 120, so these are shorter than that. And I'm in the second quadrant, so I've got a real part that's negative and an imaginary part that's positive. For the second phase, I punch this in my calculator, and I got 1.5 plus j 2.598. I'm in the first quadrant, so that agrees. This is longer than this, so my angle is closer to 90 than it is to 0 compared to 45. So this seems reasonable to me. I multiply top and bottom here by which ratio. I'll take the conjugate of the denominator, it was a minus sign where I had the plus sign, and multiply the ratio of those two, which is just multiplying by 1. So again, I'll take this first term times this, I get a minus four and a half, and I take the minus three times the minus j 2.598, and that's a plus j 7.794. And then I took this term times this, which is a plus j 7.794. And then the product of these two, I get a j squared, which is minus one, I have an additional minus one here. And the product of those two is 13.5. For the denominator though, I have 1.5 times 1.5, so I get that squared, and then I have this term times this term, which is a minus j 3.897. And then I have this term times this, and it's a plus j 3.897. And then the product of these two, I get 2.598 squared. And then I've got j times j, which is minus one, times another minus one. What happens when you multiply by the complex conjugate, these terms drop out. So what I've got is just a real result in the denominator. So squaring that and squaring that, I get this, and that's equal to nine. Adding the two real parts together, I get nine. Adding the two imaginary parts together, I get 15.588. Dividing this into here, I get 1. Dividing this into here, I get 1.732. Same result we had last time, but a little bit more algebra in doing the rectangular form over the polar form. So the polar form is a little bit quicker. When we do symbolic work, we won't be able to do the polar form. We won't be able to do the rectangular form. So we'll still find these techniques useful in certain applications. And this is how we do complex algebra with phasers.